Hey friends, I'm Scott Hanselman. Here's another computer thing that they didn't teach you. What happens when you type a URL in your browser and you press enter? Okay, this is a common interview question. Some people feel like this could be an interview question that is really focused on trivia. Like, why do you care? Um, for me though, when I ask this question, I'm not interested if they know the trivia. I'm interested if they can puzzle out how it must work how it might work if they don't know how it works, and how they can basically design a system on the fly. Or we'll talk about TCP IP, we'll talk about DNS, we'll explain all of these different things. Now, here's the question. Do you need to know this? It depends on your philosophy of life. For example, if you drive an automatic stick car or take a bus or an Uber, or maybe you're in the future and you have a cool electric self-driving car, do you need to know how to drive a manual stick shift car? Do you need to know how to change a tire if you only use Uber? Do you need to know how an internal combustion engine works in a world of electric cars? One would argue that if you know those things, you'll maybe have a more satisfying life. You'll be more excited about how things work. You'll be more fascinated by the world around you. You don't need to know what happens when you type in google.com or bing.com and press enter, but a lot of stuff does happen. If you're going to become a techie or a computer person, understanding those layers of abstractions, and there are many, is really important. And the great thing about a question like what happens when you type a URL in, in your browser and press enter is that it depends on your perspective. If you're interviewing for a database job, Maybe we don't care about the HTTP and TCP IP stuff. I want to hear about what happens to the database on the back end. If you are going to be a network engineer, I might want to know about how you design the firewalls between the user and their server. I talked to an engineer once who was a mechanical engineer, and I thought we were going to have a deep conversation about the internet. And the individual said, well, you press enter and then the key kind of like comes down and the pieces of metal touch and then an electron jumps across and they started describing the internals of what happens when you press enter down to like the physics of it, the electrons and the electricity of it. If you think about it, this is a very famous concept and a famous quote. Computers are just big rocks that we taught to think. We took silicon and we made it smart. The layers of abstraction are overwhelming. When you're a software engineer, you want to think about one layer deeper than you usually work. So for example, I'm not a mechanic. I probably couldn't take apart a car from scratch and put it back together, but I can change my oil. I can change a tire and deal with the basics. So if you're going to become a web developer and you're going to spend time looking at things like this, then you might want to be able to debug a few things. So let's talk about them. Okay. The whole internet runs on TCP IP. This is a thing that's called the Internet Protocol Suite, uh, Transmission Control Protocol, uh, Internet Protocol, TCP IP. Sometimes it is TCP slash IP. And this is the thing that uh, transfers information between a web site, a web server, and a browser. So I'm a browser, I'm the client. This is a client right here. And it is going to talk to a server. So if we type in Hanselman.com and we hit enter, we're talking to a server. I'm the client, they are the server. The same thing applies if I go and do the same thing with my phone. My phone is a browser that is the client as well, okay? So when I went to my browser here and I typed this in, this is my URL, my Uniform Resource Locator URL. And this has a protocol. It has a domain name. And then if it has something afterwards, like slash blog, it has a path. So protocol, domain name, and path. Three different things going on there. And the S, of course, means secure. HTTP means hypertext transfer protocol. So when we go into the browser and we type something and we press enter, this happens. This domain name here has to turn into an IP address. I'll talk about networking in detail in another video, but that Hanselman.com, I need to find out where that is. So if I say ping Hanselman.com at my command line, I'm using 
Ubuntu. You can probably do this in Windows as well. I happen to be on Windows using WSL. I can see that Hanselman.com has this IP address. If I typed in Google.com, I would get a different IP address or Microsoft.com. Getting that valid IP address is step one. This is just like looking someone up in, in your address book. Uh, older people might say looking them up in the yellow pages. DNS is the domain name servers. They are the yellow pages for the internet. They maintain tables and tables of these different names and the actual IP addresses. Ping twitter.com and I can see the IP address. All right, that request was just for the domain name. Notice that we didn't say anything about the protocol or the path. I just wanted to make a phone call. This is just like calling your dentist's office and you just know the main number. When you get there, there'll be a switchboard. You could say, well, can you connect me to this office or can you let me talk to the nurse in the back? Once you get in, you can hop around. This gets us to the front door of Twitter or the front door of Google. And then from there, we can go to another path we can also go in the front door, we can go in the windows, depending on what protocol we decide to use. Hey friends, I know I usually do this in one shot, but this is me from the future in a different shirt coming back because I slept on this explanation and realized that someone was gonna complain that I said ping, answerman.com. So ping is a tool to see if a web server is up and you go, hey, 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 are you there? And it echoes back, yeah, I'm here. Uh, ping is kind of like sending out a radar ping on a, a submarine. It is not, of course, name server lookups, but I use it as an example because it's a very convenient thing for people to understand. To be more specific, if you say NS lookup, name server lookup, of course I can only type when people aren't looking, so everyone can look away. And I type Hanselman.com. It goes and it says, hey, using this server, I'm gonna go and look up this name and find it at that address. Now I can change that server, I can try something else, like let's try a server inside my house here. Let's see if this is a server. I'll say, hey, here's another DNS server. I'm gonna use a different Yellow Pages. Before I used this Yellow Pages, and now I'll use that Yellow Pages. I'm gonna use a different directory. It's like looking for a contact on your phone or looking for a contact on your partner's phone. And here I just said, the server, the name server that I want you to check is this. And of course the IP address is the same. That's because domain name services, DNS, is something that is global and distributed. I could do something else. I could say server 1.1.1.1. And I could say, what do you think Hanselman.com is? Or I could say server 8.8.8.8, .8 which is Google, and say Hanselman.com. And the name is going to come back each time. But sometimes when names do not resolve into numbers, it's the DNS server is down. And if you look on your machine, you probably have at least two DNS servers. So again, you go into the browser, you type up, you type in uh, Hanselman.com, you hit enter, DNS lookup occurs. I was using ping as the example. That's not a DNS lookup example. It does two things. It looks up the name and it sends out the packet. NS lookup is the more specific version. My apologies and back to the past. Now under Linux, I can also ask questions about who bought the domain. I can say, who is Twitter.com? You scroll back, that went by really fast. Look at this, Twitter.com, Market Street, the phone number. Let's look up my domain. I'm gonna say clear, who is Hanselman.com. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Okay, so it's hosted by DNS Simple and it was purchased in 1998. So I've had Hanselman.com for 23 years, which is pretty cool. All right. So when the browser sees someone type Hanselman.com and press enter, there's a DNS lookup. We have to turn that into an address, into an IP address at that moment. And sometimes that IP address will be cached. It'll be held in memory because you don't want to have to look up the number multiple times. Basically, once you add someone to your favorites in your phone, you don't have to keep looking them up in the yellow pages. They're in your faves. Developers will often say, it's DNS, or it's always DNS. Whatever the problem I'm having is always DNS. Oftentimes, we'll have to go and flush 
DNS, just like flushing the toilet, and say, can you erase the DNS and then just look it up again for me. Maybe the number has changed. And those numbers do change sometimes. So that's a thing to watch out for. Now, when we go and talk to Hanselman.com, or in this case, 13.107.246.13, this dotted, what is called a dotted quad, the browser does what's called a three-way handshake. It's gonna go and talk to port 80 if we are over HTTP, a port is like a window in a building. Hanselman.com is the building. HTTP is port 80. HTTPS is port 443. And it says, hey, uh, we cool? Can we synchronize? It's called a SYN, S-Y-N request. And then port 80 is listening. And then it returns. Yeah, that's cool. You know, ACK, SYN, synchronize is cool. I'm going to acknowledge you, A-C-K. It sends back a synchronized acknowledge. And then the person says, oh, okay, cool. So we're talking. And this just goes back and forth. It's very low level. This is not something that the browser worries about. And it happens very, very fast. You just go, boom, and we've made a connection. It goes, duh, duh, duh. it's called a handshake. It's like, oh, hey, I'm offering you my hand. Oh, okay, cool. I'll offer you my hand too. And now we'll shake. That's called a TCP IP handshake. There's actually a great diagram that I'll bring up that's good. You may have learned this in school, but not all of us went to a fancy school, so it's worth bringing up. This here is a diagram that's called the Open Systems Interconnection Model of Network Communication. Blah. OSI. It's the OSI model. And all it's doing is saying that there's layers because I don't want to think about the physical layer, bits and bytes and ones and twos. I don't want to think about how, how the, the actual electrons are running along this, these twisted pairs of wires or how uh, that's going through radio frequency and Wi-Fi. All that happens. Let's think about that. When you type in Hanselman.com or Google and you hit enter, a miracle happens and a bunch of stuff that you don't have to think about. Could be wire, could be fiber optic, could be Wi-Fi. Here's the thing. You don't have to know every detail. But it's nice to know that while you're driving your fancy self-driving Tesla, someone invented the wheel. Let's not forget that the wheel exists. Tires are a thing, my friend. So we look at this application layer, those upper layers, uh, the message format, the way we're going to talk between the human and the machine, uh, any authentication if we put in our names and our passwords. When we decide to return our HTML, our hypertext markup language, all of that stuff is very high level. At the low level is the physical layer, the transport layer. How, is those, how are those bits uh, being expressed? Sometimes you'll hear wires like this called Ethernet wires. In fact, Ethernet is the format, not the wire. This wire is actually called an RJ45. And Ethernet is what goes over that. And that's kind of interesting. The application layer is where the web browsers exist. So humans think about layer seven and operating systems and things like that think about stuff at a lower level. So let me move to another diagram. These diagrams have been on the internet for a long time. So I can't claim that I made these. These have been parts of books for many, many, many years. Here are those same layers with our upper layers expressing our application, going all the way down to ones and zeros in some magical format on the wire or in the wireless. IP, that's part of TCP IP, makes protocol fragments and it chops them up into little pieces, little packets. It's as if you were mailing a letter to a friend, but you ran out of envelopes, so you just get another envelope. I'll just mail you two letters or a letter and a half, and I'll break it up into chunks and I'm going to keep mailing you letters in the mail and yeah, they may come out of order but I'll make sure that they get combined in the correct order so that when you get those envelopes they'll really just be in a giant envelope and you won't even have to think about that you'll just open the letters and it's as if I sent you a book but in fact it was all sent in pieces just like when you order packages from Amazon and you get them in three or four boxes but the thing that you assemble at the end is intact. So when we type in Hanselman.com and we press enter, the 
DNS, the domain name lookup, is hidden from us. The IP address information is hidden from us. The fact that it's talking on port 80 or port 443 is hidden from us. Uh, and the fact that it's making an HTTP request is somewhat hidden from us. But because we're using a browser, uh, we can go into our tools and open up developer tools if we want to see those things. All right, I'm going to make myself smaller now and go look over here in the corner. All right, so here's our developer tools and I'm just going to hit refresh and look at our developer tools here. Each one of these individual rows is an HTTP request. All of these are for pictures. This one is for JavaScript, and that was the web page. So when I said Hanselman.com, it got the web page immediately, and then it got a bunch of other stuff. And in fact, you can see that the web page came in in just over 50 milliseconds, just over 50 milliseconds. That is just a little bit more than half of a tenth or a twentieth of a second. Very, very small amount of time. And then it parsed it, it took it apart. And then it said, oh my goodness, I need to go and get pictures and JavaScript and all this other stuff. It didn't know about that stuff before. It figured it out by looking at the page. And then it started asking for other things. And these colors will actually tell you what it was looking for, what it was doing, and how long it took for it to do each of those things. What's interesting though, is we can do a lot of these things from the command line. We can do a lot of these things from the command line. The command line can be a browser of sorts as well. For example, when we uh, hit our website and we get a certificate, we get a certificate that says, hey, I guarantee that this is Hanselman.com. I promise it and all of your traffic will be encrypted. We're using a certificate and that certificate in this case will expire in October. That was also a handshake, a back and forth. We can go and ask those questions at the command line. I can say, use the curl tool. Curl is a way to make an HTTP call from the command line or from the terminal. And we'll go and we'll say, let's ask HTTPS Hanselman.com for its certificate. And we'll go back and forth. Notice that that number came up, our, our IP address. And we connected, and we're gonna go and say, hey, are you cool with this version of HTTP, HTTP 2? I can offer you HTTP 1.1. Uh, do we have some certificates? Look, hello, oh, well, hello. They're having all these conversations. I'm gonna try talking in this way. Do you speak English? Well, I speak Old English. All right, I'll speak Old English as well. Let's have a chat in Old English. I'm assuming that that's how they talk, right? Okay, cool. We've decided that we're going to talk HTTP2 Old English uh, and uh, yourhandsman.com. Here's my certificate. Is that cool? Yeah, that's cool. I think that's great. I want to get something from you. I want to get the root. See that slash? That slash might look familiar if you've ever used DOS or the command line. It indicates a path. So we're saying, go and give me the root of this thing because I typed in Hanselman.com. It gives me the root, the, the top level page. I didn't go to slash blog. It would have said slash blog here. Can you get this this way? Let's break that down. Verb, noun, adjective. Go and get this thing here using this technique. Oh, well, who's asking? Curl. Curl, okay, Curl's asking. If I was using Edge or Chrome or someone else, Firefox, it would show up here. The agent acting on behalf of the user. Who is the user's agent? Who did I send to the store to get my cheese? Oh, well, I'm acting on behalf of Scott. I will be the, the agent of Scott. He gave me power of attorney to get his cheese. And then we have back and forth, and these arrows indicate which direction. Oh, I'm sending it out to the server and the arrow back says it's coming back from the server and have whole conversations or you could do a whole class on just curl which is super fun all righty now those http requests have headers 
Remember that get? Go and get this. This is a friendlier way to look at it. We're looking at it inside of our developer tools inside of the browser. And these headers here are name value pairs. The names are boldface. The values are on the other side of the colons. And this tells me all kinds of things about security policies and stuff. And on the request, there's lots of information. You wonder why people know so much about us. They know that I speak English. They know I speak English because my browser asked for the page in English. It said, I speak English specifically from the US. Not EN-UK, but EN-US, and then optionally any other English that you might have. And if that was uh, Spanish, it would be ES dash ES. It includes the name of the language and then it includes the locale. So ES Espanol and ES España. And then this can be a weighted list. It can actually have a list of languages that I speak. Well, English and a little Chipotle Spanish and some bad French and in that order. And you give me the language that makes you happy. And then if you hear about cookies, what's a cookie? We always hear about cookies, but no one ever sees them. Cookies are just name value pairs with information like that cookie consent, I'm cool with it, or I came from Bing, or whatever. A lot of information in the headers. And then in the response, look at that. There's the HTML. You might be familiar with that if you've seen things like view source. So if we go back to the command line over here, we do that curl. But instead of that IV, we go and ask for just the page. Let's scroll back up because it's a bit of a long page. Here I'm just going to say curl. Notice that I had to be very specific. This is an interesting one. So this is probably more information than you need, but I find this stuff, I find this stuff fun. I said curl. Hanselman.com, and then I tried to add a little thing to the end, and that didn't work. And then I finally got it when I typed in www.hanselman.com. The reason is, is that when I asked for Hanselman.com first, it said, eh, that's not actually where it is. It's, it's over here. It returned a response code. There are a series of response codes that come back from HTTP. 200 series means cool. 300 series mean eh, go over there. 400 series means it's your fault. 500 series means it's my fault. So you might see things like 200, okay. Uh, or in this case, 301, it's over there forever. It's permanently over there. You may hear HTTP 302, it's over there temporarily. Or 404, that's probably the most famous one, which is page not found, probably your fault. Or 500 errors, which is page not found, probably my fault. Something horrible went wrong, it's really application error. Here is where the actual final location is. If I ask for HTTPS with the www, with the, the trailing path, that will give me what I want. And here I'm now browsing the web, aren't I? I'm browsing the web at the command line, but that's no fun. I need something to draw this HTML. That's why we don't do this anymore. There used to be a browser called Lynx, L-Y-N-X, and you can go and use Lynx if you want to do internet at the command line. This would be kind of like the Model T of uh, Tesla's, I guess, wouldn't it be? Let's do something silly and see if it even works. I'll take this curl and I'll change that to links. This probably won't work. Oh my goodness, look at that. That's my homepage. Look, I can move up and down. Let's click on something. Enter. Look at that. That is a that is my web page in text. And it works just fine, doesn't it? And that's okay. Isn't that fun? We just drove stick shift for a second on the internet, as well we should. All right, cool. 
So we are learning about um, TCP IP, DNS, domain name services, that it turns a domain name into an IP address. Then on top of that, in that layered system, we see HTTP, we see that HTTPS is secure, and there was a certificate handshake there. We see that there's HTTP versions that are negotiated, and also that there are HTTP errors and success responses. 100, level, 100 layer, or 100 series rather, is informational responses. 200, good job, success. 300 means you go look over there. It's usually redirection. 400 is your fault, the client made a mistake, and 500 is my fault, the server made a mistake. Okay. Now, on the back end is a server. Who gave us this HTML? If we do that view source, who made this? Now, that could be a file sitting on the disk somewhere, like a, you open up a JPEG or you open up a text file. Those are called static sites. They're static because they are unmoving, they're unchanged. I have lots of static sites. They don't have any work behind them. But when I hit Hanselman.com, it's got a list of my most recent blog posts. So that is dynamic. That changes from day to day. So that is not a static site. So there's a back-end server architecture. So the back-end is what's serving that HTML. And the front-end is this HTML, this hypertext, and these graphics, and things like that. All right? Now, we can get into maybe in another video on the back end, how complicated is it? This right here is sitting actually uh, uh, behind a load balancer. And a load balancer is when you have more than one web server. So when I said this website is sitting behind a load balancer that balances the load, when you hit twitter.com, there's not a single computer that serves your pages. There's in fact, hundreds of machines potentially that are all taking turns. They might be taking turns round robin where it's like, okay, it's your turn and now it's your turn and now it's your turn. Or the load balancer might say, gosh, so many people are hitting Twitter right now. Who's busy? You, are you free? Can you handle this? Busy waiter at a restaurant, busy web server in a web farm behind a load balancer. Can you take table seven? Okay, now I need you over on table eight with a manager in between. We'll talk about that and backend architecture in another video. Please do subscribe if you like these videos. And by the way, just an FYI, kids, I'm on the TikTok now, friends. I'm having a blast. So check me out. I just started a TikTok last weekend and I'm answering questions. I'm talking about wired versus wireless. So if you don't have the patience to go through a 30 minute YouTube, well, you can enjoy a, enjoy a one-minute TikTok. Thank you.